everybody and welcome to the kind of bioinformatics workshop. Uh, my name is George Mihaescu. I'm a cloud architect uh, in the bioinformatics department and um, I architected uh, the collaboratory environment which is um, a cloud environment uh, designed for bioinformatics and especially cancer um, genomics. So it has um, special uh, tunings and uh, design decisions that um, cater for this um, special kind of workload, which is uh, very large files, um, very long uh, and high intensity, uh, high CPU intensity um, workloads. So uh, in this uh, module, which is module number three, we'll uh, um, understand the, what is the cloud status, uh, because Cloud is a relatively new uh, domain and uh, it's still very actively uh, changing. So uh, what are the main uh, providers? What is uh, in the research um, area available? We'll talk about Docker, uh, its benefits, the difference between a Docker container and a virtual machine. For those of you who haven't uh, used Docker yet, maybe you're more uh, <laughs> used to use the virtual machines or HPC clusters. And then uh, how Docker is becoming a very important tool in uh, bioinformatics. And then we'll look at Docker, which is uh, a YCR project to create a uh, Docker hub, like a registry for Docker containers for, for bioinformatics. Uh, if we look at um, the history of um, how IT was delivered, um, 30, 40 years ago, there was a mainframe and everybody had a terminal and they had to use uh, um, the mainframe and have time slots. Mm -hmm. Then they moved into uh, individual servers, more distributed, uh, like uh, smaller workloads. Uh, but the idea is that uh, it's a very uh, dynamic and fast changing um, um, field. So uh, if Maybe two, three years ago, uh, people in um, software uh, departments uh, used to order a server for a project and the IT department had to uh, buy the server, order it through a vendor, uh, wait for the shipment, rack it in the data center, connect the cables, do all that. It could take months to, to, uh, of planning and of waiting before you can actually do something useful with the server. Uh, with the advent of virtualization, uh, the process was uh, much more streamlined, but still uh, the software developer or the project manager had to uh, fill up some forms, ask the internal IT department to provision a virtual machine, uh, wait for the networking team to configure the network, maybe security team to configure the security. So it still it was taking days. And then uh, cloud came in and uh, you can sign up for a cloud account on one of the public uh, cloud providers. Um, you put your credit card and um, start a virtual machine which is available in a few minutes, uh, up and running, and you use it uh, for as long as you wish, and then you terminate it, you are only charged for that time. Then relatively, uh, even like a year ago, uh, Docker, uh, which is a company that uh, started um, and uh, took uh, an older uh, Linux kernel functionality, which is uh, LXE containers, but added an API and a management interface that allows somebody to um, start uh, Docker containers, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the idea is that you can uh, start um, a Docker container in a matter of seconds, so much, much faster. And because technology never stops <laughs> innovating, uh, now uh, AWS came up with a newer uh, concept, which is uh, Lambda functions, or serverless, um, as it is called, where you don't actually have access to a server, you don't have uh, to deal with uh, file systems, with disk space, with uh, CPU cores, with uh, monitoring, with any of this. You just upload your uh, Lambda functions, which could be in Python, Java, there are a few languages that are uh, available, and um, AWS basically executes that code for you, and um, it charges you only for uh, 
the number of requests that you, your function sent, as well as the time that your code executed. So this is the latest uh, innovation, and probably we'll see it more and more um, used uh, as it matures. Right now, you can do everything with laptop functions, but there are workflows and uh, different applications that uh, um, can be converted from a regular application into a, a lambda function. And it can be very uh, cost efficient. Uh, if we look at the cloud technology providers, basically the market, uh, there are three uh, cloud providers. AWS probably has 80% of the market. <laughs> Uh, Google Cloud Computing and uh, Microsoft Azure also um, investing a lot of money in, in this field. Uh, on the private, and there are a lot of smaller um, cloud providers, um, especially in US, but also in Europe. Uh, Rackspace is one of them. Uh, Softlayer, uh, which is a company that was bought by IBM, DreamHost. In Europe, there are like 19, 20 uh, providers just using OpenStack. So OpenStack, um, yes? What's the difference between public and private providers? Well, uh, private is um, an environment that is um, built and is accessible just to that organization. Like OICR has its own private cloud. Uh, basically, it's um, available just to OICR researchers accessible only from inside the OICR network. Uh, it might or might not have a cost recovery um, feature, and um, it's private. It's it's that organization's uh, environment, as opposed to public, where uh, you have multi-tenancy. Uh, you uh, charge for the service. Um, it's a business, basically. This is private and public, and then there's academic and commercial. Yes. Academic and commercial. So an academic cloud, like a, a public academic cloud, would be free of charge. Collaborator is going to be a public academic. Commercial. It's going to be public, well, be pay for use, basically. Yes. So, but there are others which are sort of niche specific. They're, they're public in the sense that, let's say, if you're interested in, likewise, like the laboratory is going to have genomic data set. I know of other ones that have, let's say, microbiomes, they have bacterial DNA sequences and data sets that are open to, to their students. But then once the students go, they can go back and, and use the resource still. Mm -hmm. And it's at the University of Colorado or something. So it's at the university setting. It's a cloud-like infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it's public, but it's specific to that kind of activity. So they're supporting people involved in microbiome yeah. research. Yeah, so the definition is a bit blurry because yeah. you can have a mix of multiple. You can have an academic cloud that still charges money. So yeah. that's, is that the commercial? In a sense, maybe well, it doesn't make a... Enough, yeah, so... <laughs> but... Uh, um, OpenStack basically uh, started in 2010. Initially, it was a joint project between NASA and Rackspace, which is a large uh, data center provider in the US. Uh, NASA was working on a cloud software for their, um, to store their um, images of the space, and Rackspace was working on a cloud software to manage virtual machines in their data centers. And uh, they found about each other's projects, uh, and uh, they said, OK, let's open source our code. And this is how uh, OpenStack uh, was started. And there was, a, after a few years, Rackspace uh, released the, the control of the um, code to, uh, they created a public foundation. And the uh, foundation is, uh, has gold members, platinum members, but also regular people who can be uh, OpenStack Foundation uh, members, which I am one of them. Anybody can sign up and uh, will have to vote uh, twice a year. And there, is a, there are a number of members who are uh, in the board of directors, like technical chairs. And 
there is a governance model. Uh, there are two conferences uh, a year where uh, a new release of OpenStack um, is ready. And um, other interesting thing about OpenStack is that uh, early on they decided to uh, write uh, the software in Python. Uh, because it's a higher level language, uh, it's very easy to uh, troubleshoot and also uh, very easy to uh, learn. So they grew their developer uh, base uh, fast. In the last release, it's I think like 2,000 people over the world who committed coding to OpenStack. Uh, most of them working for um, companies, but also just individuals who um, sign up the um, uh, agreement to, to, to give the code changes for free and they can commit uh, changes. It's developed on Python in GitHub. Um, and uh, very important, basically, uh, OpenStack uh, um, innovates and uh, tries to offer the same services that are available in, um, in Amazon. So OpenStack has the same building blocks. Uh, I will discuss about uh, the parts of the main parts of OpenStack in the next few slides, but it's very similar in terms of uh, concepts and um, features. It uh, Amazon, uh, Google Cloud Compute, and even uh, Microsoft follows the same model. So the market, even if it's uh, still new, uh, starts to have some standards on. The offerings of, of a cloud environment. We discussed about OpenStack about the six month release cycle. Uh, initially, uh, it focused on the core services, as I said, compute, meaning that it starts virtual machines but also can manage physical servers. So, OpenStack can deploy an operating system directly on a server. When you are done with that uh, server, uh, you terminate it. And basically, that server is uh, reformatted and is put it, it is put back into a pool, so somebody else can say, "Hey, give me a bare metal server instead of a virtual machine." They get dedicated bare metal server with the operating system of choice already installed. That's going to take a little bit longer than spinning up a virtual machine, but OpenStack can do that as well, depending on uh, environment where it is installed. Uh, networking, block storage, we'll all talk about all these uh, pieces in the next few slides. Uh, currently, there are more than 19 projects that have all kinds of services like telemetry, so metrics about the cloud used for billing, orchestration, uh, if you are familiar with the cloud formation from Amazon, database as a service, um, messaging as a service, logging as a service, everything as a service. Basically, uh, this is a diagram of how OpenStack looks like, but this is actually a small piece of uh, its architecture. I'm not sure if you can see very well in, in the diagram, but basically, uh, the users uh, come usually over the internet and they connect either to the dashboard, which is a web uh, user interface, web as user interface, okay, or they talk to the API of the services. The Nova API is the API service that takes requests from the users and uh, executes them. Talks to the compute nodes to tell them to start virtual machines or to terminate them. Neutron is the API for the networking service. Takes the requests of the users to create virtual networks, uh, start DHCP servers, allocate IP addresses, all that work that your uh, network admin has to do. Through a sim simple API call or a click on the dashboard, OpenStack is going to do it for you. So you don't have to in, uh, talk to your networking team, to your uh, sysadmin team, to your security team. Uh, the developer has the power to basically do all this uh, very easily. Still, uh, he has to know some networking, he has to know some security, he has to know some system administration, but he doesn't have to wait for anybody. So you basically get the power as a software developer or regular user to do all this um, and you can script it and it's much, much easier and faster than uh, how it was done before. Um, some of the design uh, tenets of OpenStack are that it has to be scalable, no single points of failure, 
and highly available, which means that um, all the services have to provide the RESTful API. Uh, they talk between each other either through their own API services or through uh, messaging queue. Uh, they use uh, only when it's needed a database for keeping state. The database of choice in OpenStack right now is MySQL, which has an active active uh, option. So usually uh, you run three MySQL servers, all of them are active. So in case uh, any of the servers that holds the database uh, fails, your cloud is not affected. Or you can do maintenances, taking one server down at a time. So it is designed basically to allow um, live maintenances with minimal user uh, impact. This is a screenshot of the dashboard, which is uh, the project name. So OpenStack has project name for all its pieces. So Nova is the project code for compute. Neutron is the project code for networking. Horizon is the project called for dashboard. So if you hear about Horizon or dashboard, it's basically the same thing. So dashboard uh, is a, as I said, web-based uh, application written in um, based on Django, a Python framework, and uh, highly customizable. You can um, add new panels, more functionality. The source code is public, it's on GitHub. You have basically the freedom to innovate. And many uh, private cloud environments and academic uh, uh, institutions take OpenStack and then they customize it for their, for their needs without paying any licensing fees or so. Uh, if we look at OpenStack Nova, um, OpenStack Nova is basically a cloud computing fabric controller. Basically, it can, con can control uh, the compute part. Okay? As I said, it can deal with uh, bare metal servers. Oops, sorry. It can uh, control uh, Docker engine and start Docker containers. Uh, it can deal with the Zen hypervisors. Uh, QMO and UML is are uh, not very used. Um, Hyper-V the hypervisor from Microsoft, KVM, the open source uh, Linux kernel hypervisor, VMware vCenter, so all the major hypervisors, uh, open source and commercial, are supported. So the companies who build like VMware and uh, Microsoft, they actually wanted to uh, provide a driver to OpenStack so people can use their paid licensing hypervisors with OpenStack. Otherwise, they would have been left out of this market. And they had to basically uh, be OpenStack Foundation members and um, support the code and um, improve it. OpenStack Cinder is the name code for the block, um, block storage. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, Amazon uh, and uh, EBS, Elastic Block Storage, Cinder is the same thing. Imagine that you have a virtual machine and um, that virtual machine uh, runs on a physical server and that physical server uh, crashes because when you run at scale, failure is uh, a fact of life. So the more scale you have, the you have more failures. So Usually, you start your virtual machines, but you either attach a volume, which uh, is a space on a f physical server other than where the v VM runs, and you keep your data on that volume. If the server, uh, the virtual machine uh, is unavailable because the physical node where it was running crashes, your volume is fine. You create another VM, attach that volume back, and you are back in business. Uh, it's like an external hard drive that you attach to your laptop. Okay, if your laptop takes fire, you, the hard drive is fine. Move it to another server. Okay, uh, you can also grow it, so it allows a virtual machine to expand its um, block storage without having to uh, resize uh, the entire VM. So let's say you start your workload with uh, four core VMs that has 200 gigs of disk, and then 
a month later, you need more space. What are you going to do? You can start a new instance with a larger size and move all your applications over there, or you can just create a thinner volume, attach it to your instance, and now you have three extra terabytes uh, available. All you have to do to use it is, if you want, you can create multiple partitions, format it with the file system of choice, mount it, and copy your data, and it's good to go. You don't need an instance, you just detach the volume, terminate the instance, and your volume with your data is, um, is still there. OpenStack Neutron is the software-defined networking um, solution for, uh, for um, OpenStack. It allows the users to create complex networking scenarios. So uh, usually uh, in uh, enterprise applications, uh, a very common uh, design pattern is a three-tier architecture where you have uh, usually a web uh, server at the front, the middle layer, and then a database uh, backend. And these three uh, layers usually are separated by different networks for security reasons, so your database, only, only your middle layer can talk to your database, and only your front end can talk to your middle layer. You can do the same with uh, OpenStack, you can create three networks and attach your virtual machines when you start them to different networks. Uh, you can choose to have the same IP addresses that you have maybe in your uh, local environment, so you can easily replicate exactly the same environment as you have in your um, local data center. You can do it in, in a public cloud or in a, in this case, it could be a, a public cloud provider um, based on OpenStack. So Neutron is the project that deals with uh, creating virtual networks and uh, subnets and networks and virtual routers and the entire uh, networking plumbing needed to, to have a functional uh, environment. Uh, some of the OpenStack uh, very large users, so uh, of course um, telecom companies in US and Europe, uh, AT&T, Verizon, Dutch Telecom, Walmart served about 2 billion pages on uh, uh, Black Friday about two years ago from web servers running in their OpenStack-based environment. Uh, Best Buy runs their um, uh, web apps on, on uh, OpenStack, eBay, PayPal, Sony. The companies are too many to, to list. Most of the companies uh, have uh, a mix of technologies and OpenStack is one of them. And it starts to be uh, a larger and larger portion of their, they, they, they migrate more and more of their workloads into OpenStack. Uh, CERN, the um, Physics Research Institute in uh, Switzerland, has about uh, 15,000 physical servers running OpenStack. Uh, imagine just the cost savings of not having to pay the licensing fees for, um, yeah. for VMware <laughs> or Microsoft or exactly. Um, in, uh, in research, um, YCR, we have uh, two uh, OpenStack-based environments. One is internal, right here in the building, used by uh, um, uh, the staff at YCR, as well as the collaboratory, which is, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about collaboratory here. So uh, collaboratory started as a um, Ontario-funded grant um, to build a cloud environment that is going to hold uh, very large cancer genomics data sets that were collected by the ICGC project, as well as about 3,000 compute cores. And um, this cloud environment uh, is going to be used by researchers uh, in Canada and all over the world. So why are you dragging into it? Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, not the Ontario government, it's the federal government. Not Ontario? I think I thought the Ontario has anyway by the government. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's the government of federal government. Yeah. And um, 
we are in a beta um, state right now, which means that we are up and functional. We have been for about a year, uh, but we only accept uh, limited number of uh, researchers who have accounts. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> And we have about 500 terabytes of data, uh, which is indexed and available on the DCC portal. And uh, people can um, submit um, to get a, an account in Collaboratory. And basically, they have a quota of uh, resources that can, they can have access to, like CPU, cores, and disk, and memory. And the data is uh, in the same environment, so it's very easy for them to download the data to their virtual machines and do analysis instead of having to copy the data over the internet. Uh, it might take them months to do that. And um, it's basically a model where you have in the same place the compute capacity and the data needed for analysis. Uh, DKFZ, the German uh, Cancer Research Institute, uh, is a large uh, open stack based uh, cloud environment, ETRI in Korea, um, the Li London uh, Bioinformatics. Um, um, pretty much every uh, research institute, not necessarily cancer, but um, all the academic institutions have um, open stack based. Um, cloud. So as you maybe will work in multiple research institutes, you will probably uh, use the same tools and the same um, skill sets that you, you learn here. It's going to be useful. Um, some of the extended functionality that cloud offers is, as I said, uh, software-defined networking. It allows uh, the user to create virtual networks, block storage, extend their uh, um, uh, block storage uh, outside of the virtual machine's characteristics, um, object storage, uh, another very useful uh, feature. It's if you are familiar with Amazon S3, basically allows you to, like a Dropbox, allows you to upload files over HTTP and access them over this kind of interface. Um, and it allows some very large files. This is how we store the files in Collaboratory. We store them in uh, an S3 compliant uh, object store uh, using the same software that allowed us to upload uh, some of the data sets into Amazon. So um, basically, without having to rewrite the software that you use to upload and access the data in a control manner, we can. Um, use the same software for, for both OpenStack and Amazon. Cloudinit is um, a package which is pre-installed on most uh, uh, recent cloud uh, distributions. And uh, what it does is when the virtual machine starts, um, it takes the operating system of the virtual machine, like say you start a VM that's running Ubuntu 1404, okay? and you want uh, to have a flavor which has a size of 100 gigabytes, okay? It's gonna resize the file system when the VM boots to use the entire 100 gigabyte uh, disk. If you start with uh, a medium flavor, let's say, it's gonna extend it to use the size like 300 gigabytes medium and so on. So basically when you SSH into the virtual machine, you see the entire uh, physical space available in your file system. Otherwise, because it's on the root disk, you might not be able to extend it by, by your own because you are already, it's already mounted. This is just one of the things that does it for you, growing the, the file system. Another thing is, takes the SSH key that you um, choose to be injected when you start the VM, okay? So downloads that key from the cloud and puts it in the Ubuntu user's home directory. So when you SSH with your private key, you are going to be allowed SSH access into the server. Um, you can also, when you start the instance, you can pass in a file that's going to be available in the um, in the VM. Okay, like um, it's not going to be over SCP. It's not going to be uh, attached as a disk. It's just going to be in the location where you wanted it to be. Um, 
you can run a script and we'll see how you can start an instance and give it a script that's going to be executed upon boot and basically it allows for a great deal of automation which is very useful for uh, when you have to scale your workload and you have to do many more things with uh, less effort and less time spent configuring and replicating your uh, your steps another thing is to do a callback to a new url when the game is finished booting so pre-registration this kind of thing so the vm starts you don't want to wait for it to be ready you want to be notified when it is done so you just have an api server that listens and you tell the vm hey when you are done just do a post request on this url and as your vms start you'll see them uh, registering themselves and then you can do other actions based on that information uh, this is a link where uh, the cloud init project has its documentation they have a lot of examples of um, useful things you can do with cloud init the nice part is that red hat centos ubuntu debian everybody uh, pre-installs this package in their distributions so when you go to a cloud provider if they use an image of these distributions that is the cloud version of that distribution is going to 100% uh, sure uh, have the cloud uh, init package installed so you can make use of it um, let's look at docker so um, so docker is an open source project uh, again started about a year ago or so um, automates the deployment of Linux applications and um, it takes uh, an application that you you write and uh, it creates uh, like a, a container or a larger package of it it allows you to basically give that application that docker container to somebody and they run it and uh, it's just going to work so uh, you can develop your uh, application on your mac you create a docker container you give the application to your sysadmin who has debian 7 he runs it it's going to work he gives it to his colleague, runs Ubuntu 14, runs it, it's going to work, okay? No more complaints that it doesn't work on my system, but it works on my system. What version of libraries you have, there is a conflict. I cannot update my libraries to the version that you built your application against and dependency uh, issues. What Docker does basically, it takes... Uh, all the um, things that are needed by your uh, application creates as i said like a, a container and uh, it's very uh, portable and guarantees uh, the same um, runtime environment wherever it runs and it i will see some other other benefits in terms of uh, overhead and speed of deployment and so on So this is another uh, um, analogy, basically, it, it, you can run an application that requires the latest version of a library. So let's say uh, your application is written in Python 3 and you want this container or so this application to run in your HPC cluster, but they run Debian 6, which has Python 2.7, and they try to run it and it doesn't work. If you give them a Docker container, Docker container has inside, when you build it, the Python 3 pieces that are needed for the application to run. So you can easily run it on a host that has Python 2.7 only, and it's just going to run. No problems. Uh, they are much smaller than full uh, virtual machines uh, because uh, they share the kernel and the uh, main operating system is just the changes that are captured in the docker container so if you have uh, 10 docker containers you are not going to have 10 times the ubuntu kernel like you would have with 10 virtual machines so space is saved uh, because uh, it doesn't have to boot an entire operating system it doesn't have to go to the entire boot sequence of the operating system okay which is fast for linux but still it can take a few minutes to have uh, a shell prompt ready for you. With Docker, 
it's a matter of seconds. Uh, because it sits closer to the operating system, there is no emulation layer that the hypervisor would have to do. Uh, it has much better performance, closer to better perform to, to bare metal performance. Um, but of course there are downsides because your Docker containers is going to run uh, on the operating system like a process. There is a risk that uh, whatever you run in that Docker container could um, exit uh, the container and uh, see the processes from the other containers or take control. So for this reason, people, um, especially in uh, public environments, run Docker containers on top of virtual machines. Virtual machines have a much better uh, security profile and hypervisor is able to basically create like a fence around the virtual machine so it cannot um, exploit the host or other virtual machines. <clears throat> so for this reason, at least for the moment, people who run Docker container or bare metal do it either in their uh, dedicated environments. So you have three servers and you run 100 Docker containers, but it's just your Docker containers. If one of them uh, does bad things, it's your Docker container. It's going to do bad things to your other Docker containers. But you won't see cloud commercial or public cloud providers running Docker containers directly on bare metal. Usually what they do, they have virtual machines up and running, and they just schedule your Docker container to run in a dedicated virtual machine. Uh, so it's a technology that's still new. Hopefully they'll make security improvements in the way they um, uh, control uh, the risks and uh, we'll be able to run Docker containers uh, in a multi-tenancy environment on the same physical servers. So we get speed, uh, space savings, uh, all the benefits without the current security risks. Uh, it's an example of how uh, the containers are different than VM. So basically you see here that you have the physical server, the black box, okay? And then you have the operating system, which would be uh, usually it's a Linux uh, operating system. On top of that, on the, oops, sorry. on the left side, you have the gray area, which is the hypervisor, which is the KVM. And then you have virtual machines that have their own operating system, okay? So you can have a Ubuntu host with a Red Hat virtual machine. And the Red Hat virtual machine is gonna have its own, the Red Hat operating system with its binaries and libraries and you have your application and you have three of these, you have three times the kernel, uh, the, the space used by their kernels and their libraries, so pretty inefficient. On the right side, you have a physical server with the operating system which still has to be there to manage the, the hardware side and then uh, Docker containers, they share the kernel and the main parts of the operating system. It's just your application. So the overhead is much, much less than with virtual machines. And that's why also they uh, start faster and they run uh, better than virtual machines. Uh, it's another visualization of why they are so lightweight. Basically the same, as I said, so guest OS is triple replicated, like three times the, the, the VM um, pieces. Here is just, uh, if you start with a Docker container, let's say you pull a Docker container, which is Ubuntu 14.04, okay? And then you pull another Docker container, like a bioinformatics container that was built based on a Ubuntu 14.04. It's not gonna download from the internet, from the Docker hub again Ubuntu 14.04 with the changes. It's gonna say, ah, you already have Ubuntu 14.04 downloaded as a Docker container and you want something that is based on that. So you are going to download just the changes, the file system layers from the Docker hub. If you don't have any Docker images downloaded, then it's gonna to have to download first the Ubuntu plus its changes, okay? But as you have more and more containers that use uh, or are built on top of each other, you'll have a lot of um, 
space saved and uh, bandwidth and uh, it's going to take longer to, to, to pull a new container from the internet because you already have most of it local cache. Uh, Docstore is a project, is a research grant uh, granted to uh, YCR to build um, a Docker registry for bioinformatics. So there is a Docker company provides a, a registry which is like a web uh, application where you can search for Docker containers. It's about a thousand of them, um, but they are general purpose. Everything from Apache to Nginx to any application that's possible has a Docker container. And some of them uh, are malicious, some of them are um, uploaded by the companies or the um, software developers who manage the projects, but they are general purpose, as I said. Uh, Docstore is a web interface where uh, bioinformatics and uh, researchers can uh, re register their Docker containers that contain bioinformatics tools and workflows, and um, they collaborate and they, uh, you, basically it's, it's like a um, custom-made Docker registry for, for bioinformatics, and it's still actively developed. And later in module five, uh, Solomon is gonna talk more about that than Christina. Uh, currently, as I said, there are um, a number of bioinformatics tools, 27, last time I checked. Uh, we'll use in uh, the lab uh, module uh, one of these Docker containers to see how uh, it is useful. And as you can, uh, get more familiar with the technology, you'll probably be able to create your own Docker container with the tool that you might write. And you, it's, it's going to be very easy to maybe register with Docstore and tell another user to pull your Docker container from there to, to try and uh, to use it. And another uh, important thing about Docstore is that um, it has description for how to run the containers, Docker containers with the common workflow language, which is uh, standard for uh, describing uh, input and output for um, cancer genomics workflows, okay? Because in Docker, you, you have usually provided from the whoever uh, created the Docker container just an example of how to run it, okay? But doesn't tell you what is the input, what is the output uh, in a standard way. With uh, Docstore, there is a client that you can use to generate uh, a YAML file where you describe this and then you execute a Docker container with this uh, file, and it knows where to get the data, what to do with it, where to output the results okay, in, in a standard uh, way. Uh, and I think this was the last uh, slide for, for the lecture part. Um, I know that I'm speaking pretty fast, so <laughs> if you have any questions, please be free to interrupt me. So. Um, you mentioned Django. Yeah. So it's like a part of Python that allows you uh, yes, Django, as far as I know, is a web development framework written in Python. Is it easy to write? Uh, I'm not a web developer. I'm an infrastructure guy and um, cloud architect. So, uh, but my understanding is because it's a newer framework, it's a higher level, uh, higher language framework, and it's easier to learn than other um, frameworks, but of course, there is a learning curve. Um, but it, it's, it's not uh, compiled, so basically all the files that you have in Django are written in clear text. It's much easier to edit and to see what's inside and to make a change and just refresh the page and see uh, than having in Java or in other language where it might be more, more uh, complicated to see immediately how it reacts to your changes. So it's like Django, like Django? Yeah, it's spelled DJ and Django. Um, so I can tell about collaboratory because I, I, I know that you had questions in the previous lecture. So uh, right now we have uh, 
3.2 petabytes of raw storage um, because we store the data in Ceph, which is another open source project. Uh, project um, uh, Ceph uses a um, replicated uh, model. So every file that we upload to a collaboratory, um, the client when uploads, the, let's say uploads a 100 gigabyte uh, aligned BAM. Okay? The client does a parallel upload, does a parallel multi part upload, which means that it breaks the file in one gigabyte smaller files, okay, and uploads them in parallel. The server receives the files, gives the files to a, a load balancer, a number of uh, web applications to the servers that have uh, very large numbers of drives. So we have 36 terabyte, uh, 36 drives per server. So we are talking about uh, four U chassis. A U is like a pizza slide. Imagine four of these. Okay, so large servers they have 36 drives. And we use uh, we started with four terabyte drives, and then we moved to six, and now we have eight terabyte drives. So we have about 200 something terabytes per server. Okay, and in the rack we have eight servers. So uh, with a fully populated rack, eight servers of uh, eight. 36 times 8 terabyte, we have about 2 petabytes in, in a rack. And then for compute, we have high density chassis, which means that we use some uh, 2U servers that have 4 micro chassis inside. So the 2U server has a metal chassis that has 2 power supplies and fans, but there are 4 servers that share these chassis. And the four servers are individual servers. You can take them out one at a time, no problems. Each server has its own motherboard. Each server has its own uh, CPUs, dual sockets, its own memory, network cards, etc. In front of the chassis, there are 24 drives. Each of these four servers is going to see six of the drives. Okay? So, uh, in such a small space, you have basically four servers. Each server has two sockets. Uh, we use now 10 cores. Two sockets of 10 cores is 20 cores with hyper-threading enabled, which is a feature in the um, uh, in the Intel uh, chipset that allows you to basically present two uh, logical cores to the operating system. So the operating system is going to see 40 virtual, 40 logical cores. Okay, uh, 256 gigabytes of RAM. Of RAM, uh, 10 gig network interface, and the six drives that the server has access to are two terabyte drives. So we have 12 terabyte local storage for each compute node. Uh, of course, we don't present the 12 terabyte directly to the operating system. We use the RAID 10, um, uh, which means that uh, we have um, strip strapping and parity. Okay. So only if half of that space is actually visible in the operating system of the compute node. After formatting and some uh, overhead, we have about 5.3 terabytes of local storage. It means that basically when the researcher starts a virtual machine, if it gets like a eight core VM, okay, it's gonna get a quarter of the server or a fifth of the server. And it's gonna get a quarter or a fifth of the memory and of the disk. So uh, when you go to the lab side, you'll see that uh, like you get one core, 300, tera 300 gigabytes of space, and eight gigabytes of RAM, which is very, um, very good uh, ratio for resources. So if you want to do an alignment, you start with an eight core virtual machines, and you'll get about 1.3 terabytes of disk and 56 gigabytes of RAM, which allows you to basically Download the um, unaligned BAM, let's say, okay? It's gonna have enough space locally to, to fit, okay? Does the alignment which generate at least the same size? So you need basically double the space, that, okay? And we had the largest uh, BAM, which was 800 gigabytes. So if you have a very high uh, coverage uh, sample, 
with a very uh, diverse mutation, then you can have you need a lot of local disk. Uh, and we designed it like that because we didn't want a failure of a compute node to affect uh, other work workloads. Okay, so in, in cloud, uh, the idea is that failure is unfortunately a given. When you uh, operate at scale, as I said, you'll have failure. Okay, if you have uh, one server of uh, hundred failing, if you have a hundred servers, you have one percent chances. Now, if you have five hundred servers, you have five servers failing. So the more you grow, the more you'll see failure. Maybe you'll not see it individually, but it exists, okay? And the cloud is a, a paradigm where um, Amazon and Google and nobody guarantees you that there is not going to be failure. They guarantee that the control plane of the environment is going to be always available, which means that you can always start more VMs if some of them fail for some reason, okay? And uh, it's the same uh, design concept here. Basically, instead of spending money to make things unfailable because we know that it's going to cost a lot of money and it's money that you can spend to grow capacity. And even if you have everything dual, you are still going to have some failure. So it's cheaper to deal with the failure than try to avoid it. And that's basically... Um, how collaborator is designed, deal with very large files, and you have very good connectivity, network connectivity, a lot of memory, CPU, but you have to be, to, to get used to work um, in smaller failure domains. So you start 20 virtual machines, each of them downloads the files they need to the local storage, they work with them, if some of them die, no problem. It doesn't affect the other 19. Okay, you start more, you continue to work. If you work in a, a cluster-like environment where everything is uh, critical and one part, if it fails, you waste uh, days or hours of of work and you have to start again, that's, that's not a good model. 